All right, so today we're wrapping up chemical control. This is kind of the uh, next to last of our section on really control tactics, and after that we'll be moving into sort of bigger issues in IPM. Just a couple of reminders before we go. We will be having lab in Ag 119. Uh, Dave Marler will be coming in from Guard Tetelian. He's a, the PCA who works up here on the farm, and so he'll be talking to us about uh, sort of his work as a PCA, using IPM in the field. He'll be going over uh, written recommendations, which are a big part of chemical control uh, here in California. And uh, so just a general talk about that. Uh, there's not an assignment for this lab. It will be like the field trip last week. You come, we'll do a roll call, and you'll get attendance points. Uh, the lab reports have been regraded. If you turned one in, I have them up here if you want to pick them up. Overall, very nice job for the rewrites. Uh, there is one group who I don't have up here. It's because, uh, for whatever reason, the department printer is not letting me print things right now. So I graded it on my computer and put it all on Blackboard. And then finally, uh, the second exam is coming up in a little over a week. So it'll be... March 30th, that's one week from this upcoming Thursday. Uh, basically what this exam covers is all of the control tactics. So it's going to start at cultural control, which is uh, from the 23rd, and it's going to move all the way up to our last lecture, uh, which will be next Tuesday, which is going to be on resistance management. Mm. I don't have a study guide posted as of yet, but I will have one up by this Thursday. So you will have it at least one week in advance. It'll be the same sort of idea as before. Any questions about any of this before I go? Uh, I just did that this morning. So everything's posted up until this point right now. So it's going to be covering cultural control and resistance management? Cultural control through resistance management. So, uh, yeah, covering everything from cultural control yeah, up until the uh, next Tuesday. Oh, it says 228, so that would have been Oh, excuse me, that's supposed to be 328. There we go. Let's just fix that up right there, and we'll put... Oop. There we go. Through resistance management on 328. All right, so two big things that we're trying to cover today uh, to wrap up this chemical control section, which is going to be, uh, first off, just sort of wrapping up the overview of pesticides. We started last week, so this will be covering just the major MOAs, modes of action, uh, some classification schemes, and adjuvants. And then we're going to talk about the role of pesticides in IPM and sort of where do they fit inside this system. Because there's a, there's a fair amount of controversy. I was at the... Um, Fresno Madera CAPCA meeting this morning, which is the California uh, Association of PCAs. And, uh, you know, the big buzz around there right now is that there are various sources that are saying that, you know, uh, PCAs don't do uh, IPM in California and that pesticides are counter to IPM. And so there's lots of, lots of different messages going this way and that way and people feeling like maybe not enough is being done. And so I thought it might just be useful to address... Uh, how we can use pesticides and how IPM as a whole sort of sees them. <coughs> so as far as modes of action are concerned, there's lots of modes of action. Like I mentioned last time, they're classified. There's like uh, about 40 different insecticides, almost 30 different fungicides. So I'm not going to go through each of them. But what I will do is just give a general overview of the major categories. So these are the major modes of action that are associated with animals. And as far as animal control is concerned, it's a little bit tricky and sometimes a little difficult to find really good modes of action because we as humans are animals. So generally, when you're looking for targets that are toxic to one specific type of animals but aren't to others, it can be a little bit difficult. And generally, the more closely related, related organisms get, the more dangerous the pesticides get. So sort of at the top of the list here, we have... What are maybe more safe as far as modes of action are concerned because these are targeted mostly at insects. So you've got things like nerve talk, nerve poisons. We talked about these in economic entomology. These are the really big pest insecticides, um, cholinesterase inhibitors. 
um, uh, neonicotinoid uh, competitors, things like that. Excuse me. That basically just disrupt the nervous system, which is really nice because you get really rapid control. The tricky thing with nerve poisons is that every animal has a nervous system, and so even if it's designed to impact insects the most, getting a big dose of a nerve poison is still going to cause trouble inside of people. And so with a lot of older nerve poisons, like the first generation of organophosphates and pyreth not pyrethroids, um, either way, in the first batches of these nerve poisons, you did see a fair amount of cross-toxicity with people. And uh, slowly they've been moving away from that and have been doing a better job at generating really insect-specific toxins. And then, of course, you've got approaches like insect growth regulators, which are hormone mimics. And because they are going directly after insect hormones that do things that humans can't, like molting their skin, uh, there's not a whole lot of danger that you know, you're going to have trouble with people, as far as I know. Um, right. But then moving down, we start moving into things that are more targeted at mammals. You start running into trouble with uh, cross-toxicities, like anticoagulants, things that just stop blood clotting so that organisms bleed to death very quickly. Uh, acute muscle toxins, like alkaloids. Uh, if you think of this, this is something like strychnine, which is kind of famously poisonous to everything that's a mammal. Excuse me. And then further down, uh, contraceptives or antifetans, which directly just impede things that are essential to survival, like reproduction and feeding. And so again, as you start moving down into these tracts, and the closer you get to mammals, the more dangerous it becomes to people. Which is the most prone to resistance? The most prone to resistance? <sighs> Generally, what you'll find is the things that are most prone to resistance are the things that the pests are most exposed to. So it's all about the selection pressure more so than the chemistry. So they've shown that basically any pesticide that you expose the pests to frequently enough and at large enough doses will eventually develop some sort of resistance. I mean, there are even rats <coughs> that have resistance to blood thinners, you know. Uh, then again, I would assume IGR is free resistance. That's what they said when they developed them. They're, they made a lot of fanfare. They said, these things mimic insect hormones. There's no way they can develop resistance, and then they did. So uh, there's insect, there's IGR-resistant uh, scales, especially, because they were widely implemented against things like California red scales and the like. Actually, I'm going to walk that back. I'm not sure if anything has developed resistance to something like strychnine, uh, acute muscle toxins, things like cyanide, that can uh, basically compete with oxygen, I believe, to bind to the hemes in your blood cells. I don't think anything's evolved resistance to that, but at the same time, no one's real eager to go out and spray cyanide or strychnine in their fields. So I think that's kind of the challenge. Okay, so moving on uh, from sort of the animals, we move into herbicides. Herbicide classification. Uh, herbicides are classified largely the same way that insecticides and the like are. You have a aspect of selectivity and basically what types of plants do they kill. Uh, with, in general, with herbicides, you don't see a ton of selectivity. What you generally will have is uh, basically a selective herbicide that either kills grasses or kills broadleaf plants. And you're not necessarily targeting specific families of plants. You're sort of targeting really broad categories. Uh, whereas non-selective herbicides like glyphosate basically just kill everything that's green that they touch. And then also within herbicides, you have some special categories based on where the toxin goes within the plant. Uh, things like con contact herbicides directly kill the parts of the plant that they touch. So you would spray it. If you hit the leaves on the right side of the plant, they would die, but the leaves on the left side wouldn't necessarily die. Uh, but then there's also herbicides that are translocated, meaning that they hit the plant, they're absorbed, and they move around within the plant system. And there's two different categories of this, those that are apoplastic, meaning that they spread through the space between the cells. Uh, so they're not inside the vascular system. Basically, you have extracellular space in the plant, they go in there, they can move up the plant, but they can't really move down and get to the root system. So you can kill everything from the pesticide touch location upwards. 
Uh, on the other side, there are symplastic uh, translocated herbicides, which do get into the vascular system, and so they travel up and down the plants. You can kill them from the tip to the root. All right, and as far as fungicides are concerned, categorization goes into two major camps. There are fungicides that are what we call protectants, and these are fungicides that you apply uh, basically before you have a fungal problem. These are preventative, so they stop a fungal infection from uh, basically starting out by inhibiting the spores from uh, germinating and entering the plant. So you kill the spores off, you don't get a fungal infection. So with this, you do need to apply before the infection. If you do have a fungal problem already, these aren't going to do you a whole lot of good. Uh, and these are very uh, common. Uh, I'm sure you noticed if you've been driving around, there's been a lot of spraying going on recently because of the rain. People are all in a big rush to get their protectants on before it gets nice and moist and warm and get all sorts of good conditions for fungi to come out. Mm, and yeah, and hence the sensitivity to weather, since they mostly need to contact the fungus, they can get washed off pretty easily. And then you have eradicants. Eradicants uh, behave more like a traditional pesticide in the sense that it directly kills the pest. And so these are used to attack the fungus if you already have an infection. So they kill the hyphae, maybe they suppress sporulation and stop them from reproducing. Mm, excuse me. And they tend to be systemic. Sorry, systemic. Excuse me. So they're picked up, traveled throughout the plant, and so no matter where you have the infection, you're going to get some sort of dosage. Now, as far as modes of action are concerned, uh, pesticides and herbicides and fungicides are kind of interesting in that they seem to have a fair number of shared modes of action, at least in the very broad sense. Uh, clearly, since plants are the only ones that do photosynthesis, photosynthesis inhibitors are only used in herbicides. But these are just any sort of um, process that inhibits photosynthesis from occurring. So the plant is maybe sitting there in the sun, but they're not generating any sugars. Uh, most commonly, the way this works is you just disconnect the light and the dark cycles. So the plant is basically sitting there. It's producing... <clears throat> Excuse me. It's producing all the light cycle aspects of it, but it can't take any of that energy and then use it to actually produce sugars because those uh, the light generated compounds can't actually be moved over to the dark side of photo dark cycle of photos the dark side of photosynthesis. Because <laughs> um, only plants deal in absolutes. Um, all right. On the flip side, we have tubulin inhibitors. So tubulin is a major structure, uh, structural protein that's found more or less in all organisms. Animals have it, plants have it, fungi have it. It's just a basic structure that holds cells together. And so what this does is these tubulin inhibitors stop tubulin from being produced, and so the cells can't really divide. Uh, when they do build cell wall structures, they have limited tubulin, so their cell structures are all screwed up. They're not nearly as strong. And effectively, it just shuts the plant's growth down or the fungi's growth down. And so what's clever about this is they designed it so that it targets the genes that build plant and fungi tubulins, but animals have a slightly different chemical makeup to their tubulin, and so we are unaffected by this, which is nice. Beyond that, amino acid synthesis inhibition basically tacks onto the fact that there are certain enzymes that produce amino acids. And all organisms need amino acids because they are what make proteins, right? So if we shut down those specific enzymes, then we can uh, just kill the plant or the fungi because they aren't getting all of the amino acids they need to build all of their proteins. This would be a little problematic because a lot of these enzymes are shared between plants and animals. So if you got a dose of this, it would shut down your enzymes that produce your amino acids. However, what they did was they targeted enzymes that produce what are called essential amino acids. Anyone remember what essential amino acids are? Not specifically, but what's the general definition of an essential amino acid? Building blocks of proteins. Well, they're building blocks of proteins. 
What, what makes an amino acid essential as compared to a non-essential amino acid? Oh man. Sorry? Solubility. Not solubility. They have to have it in order to do certain functions, like basic life functions. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting yeah, there. All right. Uh, <laughs> Essential amino acids are those amino acids that are required to reproduce the, the um, proteins. They are. So, so they are required. So uh, I'll help you all out. Um, <laughs> So an essential amino acid is one that you have to get from your diet, right? So we have enzymes that will build certain amino acids inside our bodies. So if you have a nitrogen source and some carbon, enzymes will build amino acids for you. But we as humans are missing certain pathways to build other amino acids like thiamine. Uh, it doesn't matter how much nitrogen or carbon you have in your system, your body can't make thiamine. You have to get it straight from a food source. You need to eat something that has thymine in it. And so it is an essential amino acid, meaning it's essential that you have it in your diet or else you're going to get some sort of disease because you can't make proteins. So basically, there are certain enzymes that we don't have that make amino acids, but it turns out these plants have them. And plants can't go out there and eat a cheeseburger to get their amino acids. They're screwed if you shut down these enzymes. And so the basic idea is they build... Um, these specific pesticides that shut down those enzymes that plants have to produce the essential amino acids. And because we don't have those enzymes either, it doesn't matter if you get dosed with it. It's not going to hurt you at all. So yeah. So basically, we don't have those enzymes, so we're okay. Sterile synthesis inhibitors are, are a fungicide. They basically reduce steroid production. And steroids are essential for all manner of growth regulation and they target fungi-specific ones. And then you get sort of uh, nuclear regulators, which basically they just are the equivalent of IGRs in plants. They're kind of plant hormone mimics. They change the way that plant genes are regulated, and once you change gene regulation, you get all sorts of funky protein production that doesn't really match the needs of the plant, and so things kind of go downhill from there. All right, so before we move on to IPM, one last point is just adjuvants. So adjuvants get lumped in with pesticides because functionally a, an adjuvant is anything that you add to a pesticide to enhance its performance, customize its application, or compensate for local conditions. So the idea is that when you buy a pesticide in a jug or a pouch or whatever, it's not always 100% ready to go in your field because maybe it doesn't meet the exact field conditions. Maybe it's, excuse me, maybe it's not the right formulation for your sprayer. Maybe it's got the wrong pH for uh, your location. Maybe there are just various things that you need to change about it to get the most effectiveness out of it. And so adjuvants are basically anything you add that's not the actual active ingredient. And we basically group them, group them up into two sections. There's formulation adjuvants, these are pre-mixed in the bottle. So we talked about these a little bit earlier when we talked about the inert ingredients of a pesticide, so things that aren't active ingredients. Uh, and typically these are added to make the mixing and performance easier. So a lot of times the actual formulation, so for example, a lot of pesticides are fat soluble, especially insecticides, because you want the insect to eat it and to have their body absorb the pesticide to kill it. And so you need it to be fat soluble so it dissolves in their fat bodies. If you make it just water soluble, then it's really easy for the pesticide to basically pass through the insect and just get excreted in its urine. And the insect doesn't get that lethal dose. So what they do is they make fat soluble insecticides. Problem with fat soluble insecticides is they don't dissolve in water. So it's really hard to dump them into like a big spray tank and spray them on your field because you'll have a whole bunch of water with insecticide floating on top of it that doesn't get sprayed at the right dose. So what they'll do is they'll mix in all sorts of adjuvants like, um, that will help it bind into the water. For example, instead of making it a wet formula, maybe they take the insecticide and they mix it into clay particles. So it binds to the clay and then you spray the clay out in a very fine mist onto the field. And that way the insect will eat the clay and it'll be nice and uniformly distributed instead of having this weird mixing problem. Uh, alternatively, you have spray adjuvants. 
which are added at the time of application. That's more so a case if you have a very specific field condition that you need to address. Activator adjuvants are those that directly increase the activity of the pesticide once it hits the plant. So essentially, how are ways that we can make this more toxic directly? So things like I talked about before, such as surficants, which help the uh, droplet of pesticides spread out over the leaf so that you get more surface area covered and you don't just have one spot of really high concentration on an otherwise perfectly safe leaf for a pest. Uh, humidity retainers in areas where it's very dry, like the Central Valley, where you spray and things might evaporate and disperse very quickly, or penetrants, which help the pesticide either get into the leaf or to get into the pest that it's hit. And then finally, utility adjuvants, which just aid in the application process. So drift reducers, if you're in an area where you've got a lot of wind concerns, pH modulators, Main thing with pH modulators is if you have a pesticide that is very uh, sensitive to acidic or basic conditions, let's say you have a pesticide that can't handle acidic conditions but your groundwater is just naturally a little acidic, you might need to mix some sort of buffer or modulator in there to push the acidity, uh, push the pH up a little bit to make it more basic. All right, so pesticides in IPM. Pesticides are kind of, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, kind of a real contentious issue in IPM. People feel very strongly on opposite ends. There's lots of people in the middle who just want to use them and don't want to hear about it. Um, so it's kind of, people are all over the place. And this is because pesticides have a lot of very obvious advantages, but also some really considerable disadvantages that can't be ignored all the time. So what would, let's just do a little bit of brainstorming here. What would be some advantages of pesticides? Root crop removal. All right, yeah, so that's maybe I would consider that sort of an indirect, right? So it is undeniable that pesticides do increase the crop yield. Uh, they reduce pest amount numbers, and so you... Your crops do better, you get greater yield. That's been demonstrated over and over again. Yeah. Control outbreaks and pests. Right, so advantage is it controls outbreaks. Well, so how is this an advantage over, say, something like cultural control? It's quick. Right, it's quick. Effective. Sorry? Effective. Effective. I'm going to put a slight caveat on that. I'm going to put often. Because pesticides are one of those things where it's effective until it's not. Reduces labor costs. All right, it's uh, cheap. Well, I'm going to put, yeah, I'll put reduced labor costs because that is the most accurate. Minimize spread of disease because of that thing. Hmm. Right. Okay, so that's a good point. So I'm going to put that as indirect. Because the pesticides themselves don't stop the spread of disease, but by using them, you reduce insect populations, you may reduce vectoring. Same thing with improved crop yield. Insecticides don't actually do that directly like a fertilizer would, but you are reducing the total number of pests, and that's great for the system. Protect the consumer? Mm. We'll put... Question mark? <laughs> <laughs> this is piggybacking on the improved yield, so it increases input efficiency. Input efficiency? So we'll, we'll piggyback that on. So unpack that a little bit. So when you when you have increased yields, if you you know you reduce <laughs> pests and you reduce crop loss due to pests and you use the same amount of nitrogen, fertilizer, water, etc., mm. you increase yield, you're also increasing your efficiency. Sure. Okay. 
Right, so plants only have so much energy in their system that they can dedicate to any given thing. And so if you're, so essentially if the plant has to spend time fighting off fungal pathogens or insects or whatever, that's energy that's not getting put into growth, not getting put into uh, veg vegetative output. Uh, whereas if you've got, so basically if you've got a pesticide producing pest populations, that's more energy that can grow into that growth. And so indirectly as a grower, if you're dumping nitrogen into a field or potassium or whatever into the field, you're getting more bang for your buck out of every single thing you add. All right. That's a good list. Let's see how well it lines up. I think that's about everything I had. Right. So just to uh, unpack it a little bit, this maybe tags on to effective. It's the idea that these pesticides can provide control for pests that we have no other effective tactics against. So oftentimes we do have tools. We have multiple tools. We may have biocontrol, cultural control, etc. But there are certain things like uh, cucumber beetles. For whatever reason, cucumber beetles in cucurbits just don't have any other form of control that's very effective other than spraying for them. Because they're always kind of around, they feed on lots of different crops, and so without something like a pesticide, we would just have to accept a larger amount of damage from this pest because we don't have other tools. On the flip side, someone might be able to make the argument that because we have pesticides, we haven't bothered to make tools for this other pest. So that's a, that's a knife that cuts both directions. All right, oftentimes these guys are inexpensive compared to other tactics. So feeding into the uh, reduced labor cost. And that's really where, you know, that's where, really where this argument cuts is that essentially for something like insecticides and the, so for something like insecticides where you have an option that's either biocontrol or an insecticide, the costs kind of even out a little bit because you're not really dumping a whole bunch of money into biocontrol. They're doing the work for you. But if you're doing weed control, and you're out there, and the only way to get rid of weeds is to have someone go out there and hand, you know, a weed or, you know, dig it out with a machine or something. You're talking about much higher costs. Uh, herbicides ranging from $80 to $160 per acre as compared to hand weeding costing anywhere up to $1,100 per acre. Uh, these were numbers that were developed for uh, sugar beet growing in California. So not a huge industry, but one where weeding matters a lot. Uh, I'm sure uh, those of you in the Salinas area are very aware of the importance of weeding and have seen any amount of people out there weeding all the time. They do. Hence the next to last slide. <laughs> oh, they do now, yeah. Um, all right. Oftentimes, and this feeds into the last one, uh, they require a whole lot less energy than other tactics do. So again, with herbicides, this makes a lot of sense because you've got tillage and hand weeding, very energy intensive, you have to pay somebody to go and do that. So cost and energy are both high. Uh, again, less true with insecticides and fungicides because these are largely controlled through biocontrol and resistance, which are cheap and low energy input. The, the, your second, your second and third point, don't they kind of, aren't they one and the same sort of? They are one and the same in some ways. Um, I was really trying to separate out the fact that, well, what it comes down to is I was going to treat them as separate, so I was going to first introduce the concept of cost, and then I was going to transition into why they cost less, but because you mentioned reduced labor costs, I thought it benefited to just mention that right off the bat. So they are similar. They're more or less one causes the other. I just uh, wanted to have that transition if, I, if someone didn't mention the fact that it was labor specifically that makes them cheaper. So kudos to Dan for a astute observation. <laughs> All right. Another the thing that's nice that we didn't mention is that pesticides don't really require a whole lot of knowledge to use. You don't need to know a whole lot about the agroecosystem. You don't need to know a whole lot about pest biology. You basically need to know what's out there. And if you've got a PCA writing a written recommendation, all you really need to know is how to read a label, how to mix it, and how to spray it, which is something that you can teach a, a, you know, a farmhand to do relatively easily as compared to something like biocontrol or cultural control 
which may re require a lot of um, essentially paying attention to the timing of the seasons, maybe uh, rearing out the correct biocontrol agent, selecting the right plants to harbor them, which require a lot of agricultural and ecological knowledge. It's rapid and reliable, so when they are working, they work quickly, and um, they work reliably until they don't. And uh, moving on with that sort of knowledge aspect of it is also that you don't need to plan ahead. If you've got a tool in your back pocket that you know you can apply to the field at any given moment and knock down the pest population, then you don't really need to look that far ahead. You just need to basically be far enough ahead that you know when the pest shows up and you can apply. And as sort of a, a larger step of this, it basically gives the grower a lot of freedom over what they can grow. So if you're really beho beho beholden to cultural control, uh, things like this, you're going to need to rotate your crops in a specific way to reduce pest populations. But if you know you can just fumigate your soil, you can spray the weeds, and you can spray the insects, then you don't really need to rotate. You can grow corn every single year. You can plant almonds on almonds. You can do essentially whatever you want because you can substitute uh, ecological control with chemical control. So these are the big advantages of pesticides. And I think what it really comes down to is probably mostly these last four steps. That it gives growers a lot of freedom with relatively little need to uh, research the systems, and it's very rapid and reliable. And those four things are very appealing. So, on the flip side, what would be some disadvantages of pesticides? They're unsustainable, politically unpopular, and unpopular in the marketplace. Oh, fine. fine. <laughs> Hold on. You recited that one. I wasn't even, I wasn't even done erasing the first advantage. Ah. <laughs> All right, so I heard, uh, what was it, unpopular in the marketplace? Right, so we're getting to a point where pesticides are starting to affect the bottom line. You can make more money selling a cleaner product. And by cleaner, I mean less residues. Uh, what else was there? Politically unpopular. Uh, politically, and uh, so unpopular in the market. And politics. Uh, yeah, pesticides have largely been politicized as they are associated with the environmentalist movement, and so. Uh, it's kind of hard to have a nice rational discussion about these things. Yeehaw. All right. They're unsustainable. Uh, yeah, so unsustainable. How so? The resistance. Okay, so we'll consider that from a biological perspective. Right, because we've got resistance. But wouldn't, I mean, IPM go against that? I mean, you're saying they're unsustainable and you're trying to implement the, the rotation of modes of actions so that won't necessarily happen. I mean, no, exactly. Yeah, so unsustainable. Um, I think when we're talking about the disadvantages of IP, uh, pesticides, I think we're talking about disadvantages associated with heavy reliance on pesticides. And so IBM, you're right, definitely works to counteract this. And so these, this might be something that, um, well, maybe I'll just put mitigated by IPM, question mark. Is it, is it not? Other disadvantages? OK, yeah, so we have, um, I'm going to call that non-target damage. Getting back to that idea that pesticides are poisons, and you can't deny that, and so you will largely be poisoning pests, but you may be also poisoning beneficials, and uh, maybe even things that aren't necessarily beneficial, but are just things that are out there in the environment. Like peregrine falcons, they have nothing to do with the agriculture. Well, uh, maybe they kill some birds, but they're largely tangential to agriculture but they are perceived as having some value and people don't want to see them die due to DDT poisoning. 
Uh, other things? Off target no. contamination. All right, so uh, environmental contamination. Oh, I'm seeing. You mean like um, hitting other crops? Yes. I was talking about like water bodies or. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave that under environmental contamination, but I'll also tack on. Um, drift. Yeah, we'll call that drift. So the idea that the pesticide doesn't always end up. I think these two are similar ideas. Pesticides don't always end up where you expect them to go. Uh, sometimes they end up in groundwater, surface water. Sometimes they end up on your neighbor's crops that aren't registered for that pesticide. There's also um, pest resurgence if it's not applied properly. There's um, um, secondary pest outbreaks. Okay, so we'll tack that in here. Secondary and resurgence. Um, there's a lot of regulations that you can't go out and spray them. That's true. Them regs. The carcinogenic. Some. So, we'll, we'll type that in with human health. Right, some of them may be carcinogenic, some of them definitely are carcinogenic. Uh, and that again kind of ties into market and political unpopularity. All right, I think that's a pretty good list. Those are some serious disadvantages. So a lot of these I'm noticing, actually it's a real mix. I was thinking, I noticed with the advantages that a lot of that was very practical things associated with the uh, general advantages to the grower. A lot of these are things that are uh, less oriented in practicality so much as they are in um, values and perceptions. But so as far as disadvantages, we talked about this, right, the significant effects on non-target non organisms, uh, whether that's in the field or their sort of environmental contaminations. Um, in many cases, there are situations where pesticides are actually more expensive than alternative control tactics, such as, uh, as we mentioned earlier, specifically with insecticides and fungicides. Oftentimes it's cheaper to use a resistant plant variety or to do some extra tillage and the like to get the control you want rather than relying on the pesticides. Uh, we talked about uh, the idea of drift, so things that can uh, get out there and harm consumers and the difference between short-term and long-term damage that even though the drift may cause just minute uh, sort of uh, impacts over, excuse me, while, they, while the direct impact from those individual exposures may be low, over a long period of time, chronic exposure may cause health issues that are hard to predict in a lab. They can be hazardous to the people who actually apply them. So again, kind of tying into the idea of um, human health concerns. They can cause pest problems themselves. Uh, so resistance, resurgence, secondary pest outbreaks, and those can feed into the pesticide treadmill that we talked about earlier. Would, uh, like, socioeconomic issues that, um, like, third world countries oh. have? With, uh, that's, I think that's something worth pointing out, is that, to a certain extent, without regulations, you kind of amplify a lot of these other issues. Because if you're not being very careful, you increase your environmental uh, contamination, drift, human health concerns. And of course, the places that are going to have less regulation, less people watching out to make sure those things don't happen are going to be uh, poorer countries that don't have as many resources or areas that are growing lower value crops. So we in California grow a lot of very high value crops so we can afford to have a lot of uh, safety precautions uh, whereas other areas may not. And so, yeah, these tend to be much more amplified in developing countries uh, than they are in the developed world, where, weirdly enough, they have the luxury of regulation. All right, interesting point. So this leads to what we call the pesticide paradox. And the pesticide paradox uh, ties into the pesticide treadmill and the idea of secondary pests, uh, resurgence, and resistance. It's just the idea that by applying a pesticide with the intention of reducing a pest population, 
you may actually increase the number of pests in the system uh, if that pesticide disrupts predator-prey dynamics. So this is just the idea that sometimes you don't get what you're expecting. And this happens more often than people would expect. Uh, that basically by using a broad-spectrum pesticide of some sort, generally with insecticides, you remove your biocontrol agents and you increase the instances of those secondary pest outbreaks and resurgences. And so a really good example of this happening is a, uh, uh, a developing world example, which is rice in Malaysia. So back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the Malaysian government really wanted to jumpstart their rice production. They wanted to uh, jumpstart the economy in general. And so what they decided they would do is that they would <coughs> offer a uh, subsidy for pesticides. So that the cost of pesticides was slashed by, I want to say, about 80%. So it was very cheap for growers to get their hands on pesticides. And by the 1980s, this had kind of peaked out at $150 million per year in subsidies for these pesticides. Uh, the problem was that almost all of the pesticides were broad spectrum, and so they killed off a lot of the biocontrol agents, and there was this huge resurgence of what was a secondary pest, the brown plant hopper. And these guys right here, their populations exploded, uh, they ended up uh, causing over 2 million acres in loss in the early 80s annually. So a lot of rice getting killed every single year by a single pest. Uh, they did a lot of work trying to develop resistant plants, but they didn't get rid of their insecticides. And so basically the selection pressure against the plants was tremendous because the populations were so huge. So resistant plants never lasted much more than about three quarters of a growing season. And so ultimately the solution was that they switched to an IPM approach where they removed the subsidies. And so pesticides became more expensive and the incentive wasn't for growers to apply pesticides every time they had a problem, but it was to investigate alternative routes to control. And once they removed these subsidies, uh, generally pesticide use went down a fair bit. I want to say it was about halved. Uh, rice yields went up in response because biocontrol returned to the system. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a sad story to this, which is that in 1999, a government, um, a new government came in where basically they weren't interested in the IPM program anymore, so they got rid of it, and uh, pesticides became popular again, and uh, the brown plant hopper is back and is causing all manner of trouble still. So this Myanmar now, right? <sighs> no, I believe Malaysia is still Malaysia, isn't well, like, it? Yeah, Malaysia is a group of islands. Right, you think right. of like Burma, which is like next to Thailand. Yeah, I think Burma's Myanmar. Or Siam? I don't know. Siam is a little island off of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Well, Either way, let's, let's yeah, plug yeah. through. <laughs> I do, I have six minutes, so we'll get through this. Okay, so the general policy of IPM is that considering the advantage, the advantages, we can't have modern agriculture without insecticides and pesticides in general. And essentially we're at a point now where to keep our production as high as it is uh, and to feed the growing world population, people generally agree that you need some level of pesticide use. But on the flip side, we can't ignore all those disadvantages. And we have relied on pesticides very heavily in the past and it's caused more trouble than it caused benefits. And so generally most IPM professionals sort of view chemical control as being a necessity that we should avoid whenever possible. That essentially it's our ace in the hole that we can use whenever we get into trouble. And you see this in a lot of definitions of IPM. For example, USDA ARS uh, tagged on to part of their IPM definition is the and using pesticides judiciously. Uh, UC extension, the definition in our book even says that broad spectrum pesticides are used as a last resort when careful monitoring in, uh, indicates that there's a need. And then uh, various other extension agencies all say the similar thing, that pesticides are okay, but we need to be careful or judicious whenever we choose to use them. And so how do we integrate pesticides? How do we decide that we are being judicious? Well, there are really two major categories of this. On one hand, there's the desire to just reduce insecticide, or sorry, reduce, I'm an entomologist, excuse me, reduce pesticide use as much as possible. Uh, in whatever way we can. And then when we do use pesticides, 
we should try to choose the most selective pesticides that we can get. So how do we reduce pesticide use? Well, on one hand, we should try and develop production systems that are holistically oriented towards pest control, so that we are essentially building systems that rely very little on pesticides. And what this comes down to is basically do good IPM. Try to integrate as many different control tactics as you can. If you have a resistant plant variety, use the resistant plant variety. If uh, rotation is going to help, you should use rotation. Maybe it'll cost you a little bit of money, maybe it'll cost you a little bit of yield, but these are things that will help you in the long run. It's taking that long-term vision towards what your pest problems are going to be in the future. Uh, on the flip side, utilize treatment thresholds, like we've been talking about a lot this semester, that essentially only apply a pesticide when you need one, so that we are reducing the number of sprays, and we're only spraying whenever the pest is at their most dangerous level. So basically, avoid timed sprays, uh, which is all well and good, but clearly there are situations where it's kind of hard to decide when, is, when can we substitute a timed spray. I remember talking to some almond growers who were complaining that they were told that um, they didn't need to spray during a certain uh, rainstorm last year because they thought they had uh, enough control going on in the field that they would be dry enough to not have brown rot, and a bunch of them got really burned by it, and they were a little grumpy, understandably. And then the third thing is the idea that we still have room to improve, that thresholds are great. The challenge with thresholds is that they only account for pest populations, when in reality there's lots of ecological factors that determine how much yield you can expect to lose from pests, right? There's things like the climate, biocontrol, there's the economic data, how much is the crop actually worth at this moment? And these things can change our economic threshold calculation. The problem is that, as we noticed from the economic threshold, um, economic injury level calculation we talked about earlier in the semester, it's a very calculated sort of calculation, and we don't always have all the data. So what we really need is more systems where people are doing the research into figuring out how can we build better models? How can we build better tools that will help growers know when to apply their pesticides? Things like the spotted alfalfa lady beetle threshold we did in the alfalfa lab, where your decision on the aphid depends partially on how many of these guys are crawling around. So, and on the flip side, we have the increasing of pesticide selectivity which has two major benefits, that on one hand, uh, you basically directly save natural enemies who are going to mop up the surviving pests, which reduces your chances of resurgence and resistance. And on the flip side, because you save those initial natural enemies, you expect larger natural enemy populations down the line. So we've already talked about selectivity, eco ecological versus physiological. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I just wanted to touch briefly on some of the ways that we can, some of the newer technologies used for ecological selectivity. Well, I'll get to those. Um, all right. The basic idea is that a lot of the technologies we use to apply pesticides aren't very targeted. They just kind of broadcast spray the pesticide all over the place. And so while the pest may be present in one specific location on the plant, maybe one specific area of the soil, we just kind of spray it all over the place because it's easier to do it that way. And so using things like spot treatments and the like are a really good way to make sure you're targeting the pest. The challenge with those, of course, is that they are very uh, labor intensive. You need someone to go out there who's willing to actually spray the individual spots, whereas it's a lot easier just to rig, get a rig out there and spray the whole field. But so there are some new technologies that are designed to target those sprays a little bit more, and also to reduce the number of pesticides that are out there. So on one hand, they can be selective. On the other hand, they also just reduce the total number of pesticides used. So smart sprayers, uh, like this guy right here, are conventional blowers uh, and the like that are equipped with a little sensor. And so basically, they can detect when there's a plant in the area to be sprayed, and they'll turn the sprayer on just when there's a plant in the direction of the nozzle. And so you can sort of see here with this grapevine setup that they're just spraying the area where the grapevine actually is, and the upper nozzles where there is no grapevine aren't turned on. 
because there's nothing to actually apply a pesticide to. So they're not just dumping a whole bunch of extra pesticides into the environment. We're seeing this in a lot of new automated techniques, such as this with lettuce. This is a machine being developed by the University of Arizona, where essentially, instead of hand weeding um, or hand thinning out lettuce plots, what they have is a machine that'll cruise along, and it knows the spacing that the lettuce should be apart from one another. It has a little sensor that detects where the lettuce is in the soil, and it'll apply these highly targeted sprays of herbicide in order to kill those individual weeds. You know the problem with that is? What's the problem? They can't, they don't, the machines cannot, identify, cannot distinguish between a, a crop plant and a weed. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so if you've got a weed sitting in the spot they expect it, they might spray the... Well, yeah, uh, it's like anything outside the area where the crop plant is supposed to be, supposed to be weed. Oh, sure. And then just the last thing is these electrostatic sprayers. So electrostatic sprayers are kind of cool. Essentially, it's a conventional sprayer, but as the pesticide comes out of the nozzle, there's a little electrode right here that basically shocks the stream of fluid and imparts a negative charge onto the little um, balls of the little beads of liquid that are being emitted. And so, because most plants have a generally positive charge on their outside, what will happen is these little droplets will float out onto the air and become attracted to the plant itself, and they'll just glob right on. And this decreases the number of particles that will latch onto the soil, the number that will just sort of float downstream on the wind. Uh, they've shown that the impact of this charge is upwards of 75 times the power of gravity. So they'll actually can float past a plant on the wind and then double back and hit the plant. And it's, a, it's a neat new technology. It hasn't been widely adopted, but I've been seeing more and more of it as of late. Uh, what's kind of nice about this is that the pesticide will actually wrap around the back of the plant. So if you spray one side, you'll actually be able to coat the whole plant instead of just having to do multiple passes on each side. So I've got a short video on that. You don't have to stick around and watch it, but it's all of one minute and 20 seconds. There were no real choices in spraying technology. A solution emitted from a conventional hydraulic spray covers only the top or front of the object, but leaves much of the target uncoated, especially on the back or underneath side. Electrostatic spraying systems has changed that. Now you can coat the entire targeted object. Watch this apple duster demonstration and see for yourself. The first apple will be sprayed with a conventional spray technique without an electrostatic charge. Now we apply the electrostatic charge to the sprayer and coat the second apple. Which would you prefer? I want to blow up the pesticide. Yeah, I know, it's a bad phrase question. <laughs> bacteria or germs, only electrostatic spraying systems gives you full coverage. Please visit our website at www. Yeah, I, I thought that when I watched it the first time. I was like, ah. Oh. Normally, that's sort of the phrase you hear when you see like an infomercial, and it's um, <laughs> exactly they're trying to convince you to buy such and such. But I thought, nah, I don't want the one covered in pesticides. <laughs>